Thomas Aquinas, master of the sacred page. In the opening section of his Habilitationsschrift on Bonaventure's theology of revelation, Joseph Ratzinger draws attention to the sharp line we must draw between the scholastic and the Franciscan periods in that great saint's life, and in consequence, the two distinct corresponding theological corpora, the scholastic versus the Franciscan writings. The young Ratzinger then expressed his disapproval of those who thereby handled Bonaventure on account of his early exit from an academic career as a sort of unfertiger Thomist, a half-baked thinker, hence forcibly a half-baked Thomist. Thomas Aquinas, of course, is a fertiger uh, Thomist by contrast, and no such bright line cuts through the center of his thought and career. We cannot speak of his Dominican as opposed to his scholastic writings. Or can we, as one must with a confrere like Eckhart, split this Meister into Latin and vernacular halves? Even his sermons are university products for a university public, sober and tight little expositions, contractual events, betraying no time for frivolitates or Eckhartian exempla. Aquinas is a professor through and through. Quote, Thomas' spiritual and institutional development is unthinkable outside of Paris. Mary Dominic Chenu famously avowed, Naples, Viterbo, and Rome are merely episodes in his intellectual development and in his career. Paris is his natural habitat. This remark is obviously a fantastically French thing to say, <laughs> above all in its disregard of Thomas, own disregard for the city of Paris. I would rather have Chrysostom's homilies on Matthew's gospel, Taco reports the saint is sign. Chenu's remark, for all its Gallic infl inflation, remains redolent with insight all the same. Parin scientiarum Parisius, Paris, parent of the sciences. It will form a basic pillar of my reflection. Thomas is the ultimate university professor is not an unassailable view, however. Frederick Bauer Schmidt, in particular, one decade ago, wrote a hopeful, helpful little study challenging Chenu on this point. By consciously prying, Dominic, by prying Thomas out of his university setting, Bauerschmidt conjures the primitive Dominican context that was the air that Thomas breathed as a professed religious. It would be pointless not to accept this corrective with considerable goodwill and give more attention to Thomas as foundationally a friar preacher. Still, for my purposes, between Bauerschmidt and Chenu, there is also an important tension that we must hold on to and highlight. Thomas' deep involvement in the mendicant controversy provides an excellent and very pertinent illustration, I think. Even the spirited defense of his own Dominican vocation, and indeed of the whole mendicant way of life, is fully inscribed within the politics of a messy 13th century faculty brouhaha. The situation is admittedly complex. At base, however, it concerns a simple enough, though admittedly a high stakes showdown. The mendicants and the secular masters were disputing control of the profile of the consortium magistrorum. And through these madristi, the rights to steer the culture of the emergent medieval university itself. In redefining the office of master under new mendicant modality, the friars were powerfully melding their innovative religious identity with a reimagined configuration of the ecclesial magisterium, magisterium in its original academical sense. It is important to keep this big picture in focus. For the moment, we recall that Thomas' inception as magister was plotted in the heated circumstance of this Parisian controversy, that his long delayed principium even had to take place under an armed royal guard on account of the violent commotion. We gain a crucial perspective and can better plunge into the theme assigned for this talk, Thomas Aquinas as master of the sacred page. For master here cannot be taken in some extended and honorific sense, as elsewhere on our conference bill, Thomas as magister spiritualis, or master of wisdom, for instance, we're confronted instead with a perfectly concrete medieval job description to which Thomas resolutely conformed his entire Dominican life and through which he channeled his whole approach to sacred scripture. The conjoined duties of lectio, disputatio, and predicatio are well known and have already been well and widely glossed. For reasons that should require little defending, I will focus here especially upon the matter of scriptural reading, through, though in a culture of disputation, and still more narrowly upon Thomas' doctrine of the senses of scripture. <laughs> 
As a preface to my contribution, it is imperative to clarify one thing at the outset. No one expects originality from a medieval magister. Originality, that is, in the romantic sense of radical, frame-breaking novelty. For this reason, we obviously cannot expect originality from St. Thomas. It belongs to the simple nature of the case. Thomas' doctrine on the senses of scripture is, accordingly, despite its exceptionally dense deployment of technical terms, less a jargon-rich performance, fashioning startling new concepts or Copernican paradigm shifts, than a brilliant collage of inherited theological fragments. We are shifting, perhaps, or so I'd argue, from Kuhn's idea of, quote, normal to, quote, extraordinary science, but we are witnessing no revolution in the Kuhnian sense. When Thomas thus speaks of the distinction between verba and res as being different, two different types and orders of signifiers, significatio vocum, significatio rerum, for instance, or when he insists on the literal sense as the sole basis for theological argumentation, this, and much more besides, has the character of a synthetic recasting of existing elements from the tradition, elements that prior to Thomas had already taken on their recognizable forms. Yet something more still needs to be added, for the tradition that Thomas had mastered was not itself a university tradition. He stands, in fact, on the cusp of a maturing new site of scriptural reading, a reading community that has broken with the established world of patristic preaching and monastic lectio. Thomas was thus faced with the considerable challenge of reworking a deposit of scriptural and theological reflection crafted for a substantially different purpose and context into a theory and praxis of ecclesial reading fit for the schools. Where Bonaventure, after 1257, could thus relax into a more or less classical and comfortable Augustinian and Victorine mode of biblical exposition, Thomas remained resolutely embedded in a nascent world of professional university instruction. Here we might grant to Philip Rosman Thomas' role in the creation of the so-called methodological subject, quote, a new type of author who subjects the textual heritage to ordering and structuring techniques that constitute a decisive break from earlier ways of Christian reading and writing, end quote. Harold Bloom spoke of the, quote, anxiety of influence as a basic motor of literary tradition. I'm not sure whether we can apply this notion to ecclesiastical tradition, as a theological category, certainly not. Nevertheless, a basic impulse to constantly rewrite the whole body of antecedent theological production is manifestly present in the world of St. Thomas. We could thus easily confirm the presence of patterns like Bloom's clinamin, misreadings, tessera, completion of fragments, and so on. Alongside this contest with and in the tradition, moreover, a dynamic of intense collegial rivalry also besets the medieval university context in which Thomas took his highly contested place. If our Dominican master was thus a maestro of the restructuring of theological tropes, the tessera pattern, we must see him exercising this form of mastery in an agonistic atmosphere and university locus that was by definition deeply confrontational and even combative, supercharged in Thomas Day by the mendicant controversy. Let us accept then as highly suggestive, if not probative and certain, Mandanay's classic proposal that at the time of his inception in Lent of 1256, probably in the venue of the Dominican Studium in Paris, Thomas chose to debate a question treating the four senses of scripture, namely the dislocated inquiry that now appears as question six of Quadlibet seven, selecting this topic, as Mandanay thought, precisely to counter the Joachimite tenor of William of Saint Amor's De Periculis Novissimorum Temporum. Weishaupel demurred here, and we can promptly concede that a topic like the senses of scripture was effectively de rigueur. Thomas' praise of the scriptures and magnificent divisio textus in his Resumptio lecture, Hiccus Liber, respects the ceremonial custom, for instance. Beyond the generic occasion, we more concretely add that William of St. Amor's investment in Joachimism and use of the spiritual sense is dangerously overstated. On the other hand, the dating of Thomas' disputation is now perfectly firm. It has meanwhile also been established that the subsequent question, question seven of the same Quadlibet seven, in fact refutes Williams de Pericles directly, 
No such smoking gun betrays Thomas' specific handling of the scriptural senses in question six. And yet, as Terrell observes, from the instant that Thomas occupied his chair, we see la combativité du jeune maître, who chose to jump into the battle from the very first. Mandanay's theory, accordingly, seems to me to be undecidable rather than wrong. For the moment we grasp Thomas' scriptural project, we cannot, in fact, expect from him a direct answer to a debate that he must have viewed as theologically doomed. The heated back and forth between William's Joachimus takedown of the mendicant orders and the spiritualist Franciscan position of Gerard of Borgo San Donino was inevitably for Thomas pointlessly spinning its exegetical wheels over the spiritual reading of texts like Revelation 14.6. The newly minted doctor's quadlibet on the senses of scripture thus plainly bears a palpable resonance for the precise moment when it was prepared and delivered and an implicit challenge to change the exegetical rules of a then raging dispute. A month or so before Aquinas' inception, William had laid down the gauntlet with a memorable formulation at the end of his treatise. He challenged all comers to refute him, not with academic mummery, non per disputationum et altercationum philosophicam, al sophisticam, que ad nihil utilis est, but exclusively with sound Catholic argumentation, per collationum catholicam. Collationis here means, of course, something like a reasoned battery of scriptural texts, which is, in fact, precisely what William himself had provided. A good example of his strategy against the begging brothers is his employment of a text like Proverbs 30, 8 to 9, which says quite plainly, quote, give me neither poverty, mendicitatem, nor riches, and counsels directly against the state of poverty, since it entails the temptation to steal or speak against God. Despite his adoption of a certain Joachimite frame, such simple uses of the, quote, literal sense, in fact, broadly prevail in William's attack. When Thomas, in his Contra Impugnantes, immediately rose to accept the challenge, he met the adversary on his own terms and finished by throwing the glove right back in William's face. If anyone wishes to write against this work, it will be most agreeable to me, acceptissimum. Indeed, truth never manifests itself better than when resisting those who contradict it and when refuting their errors. As the book of Proverbs says, iron is sharpened by iron and one man sharpens the wits of another. Leaving the mutual rhetorical saber rattling aside, it is instructive before coming to Thomas, the theoretician of biblical exegesis, to see how Thomas as an exegetical practitioner actually replied. I limit myself to two brief examples, which show how Thomas and William were far from always agreed on what the literal sense of a text actually was. Thomas replied to the objection that he formulates for William on the basis of Proverbs 38, thus answers that Solomon, in fact, makes reference in this verse to involuntaria paupetas, not to the chosen state of need elected by the mendicant friars. If this point of precision refines the sense of the letter and effectively returns William's service, it does so only by introducing a distinction that emerges from a discursive world and frame of ecclesial experience well beyond the text of Proverbs itself. Such a pointed reading of the scriptural witness as Thomas here provides could only conceivably arise in the atmosphere of 1256. We must thus face the fact that even Thomas Sensus Literalis is profoundly drawn into the unstable and even volatile currents of the history of reception. To draw an analogy from a dubious jurisprudential theory, Thomas practice cannot be designated quote, originalist in any way. The literal sense deepens along with the development of doctrine and the evolution of Christian life. However confident Thomas was that he scored every exegetical point, it is enlightening to observe a case where Thomas' rebuttal failed to convince his opponent. For William, it happens, also wrote a reply to Thomas' reply to him, albeit a decade later in 1265 or 66. In the secular master's Collectionis Catholicae, we thus find the following revealing thrust and parry over the meaning of Psalms 39.18 and 69.6. Thomas at first, on the basis of these texts, attempted to prove that it was not only possible to live from spontaneously offered alms, but that one might even request them by begging, petre mendicando. This he established by a prosopological reading 
taking that is the psalmist's voice in these psalms as being the voice of Christ, explicitly calling himself a beggar. Ego alta mendicus sum et pauper. And again, ego vero edenus et pauper sum. In reply, William bluntly stated, non loquitur ibi Christus, sed vir justus. William rejects, in other words, the Christological reading and plants the literal sense of the Psalms instead in what scholars today would agree is the persona and voice of the suffering just man. William adds to this that the mendicacy at issue is not a literal begging for bread, but rather a plea for God's divine help. The formidable alignment of William's alternate reading with a perfectly contemporary take on the quote literal sense of these Psalms provides another good indication of Thomas' much deeper entanglement in the concrete controversy he was battling and the exegetical conventions of his particular time and place. That Thomas understood the Christological meaning of the Psalms to belong to its literal sense is a mini scandal that is well enough known, at least I presume in the present Thomistically over-informed company, if not always equally well understood. Thomas' view is not an entirely innovative position, of course. Regarding the exegetical technique itself, Thomas' orientation obviously registers zero on the scale of interpretive innovation. Patristic exegesis and Noble Augustine's Enerationes in Psalmos had systematically propounded the prosopological, Christo ecclesial manner of reading the Psalms, hearing in them alternately the Vox ad Christum, Vox de Christo, Vox Christi, and so on. Thomas' specific understanding of the Psalms thus stands solidly in the main current of the church's interpretive tradition. What is less clear, however, is that this long accepted manner of reading the Psalms was mapped specifically onto the Psalms' literal sense. In the 12th and 13th century, the quote, literal sense was often linked to scraps of Jewish exegesis. Thomas himself makes this connection at least twice in his earliest commentary, the Expositio Super Eseam ad Litram. If the literal level is thus a pre or non-Christian meaning, why not rather identify the Vox Christi as the allegorical slash Christological, namely spiritual sense of the text? We reach here a critical juncture where exegetical praxis and theory intersect. In point of fact, the interpretive principle at stake reaches much deeper than the interpretive precedent of the fathers, Jesus himself and the wider New Testament witness, clarify, and ground the literal sense of the Old Testament Psalms. In the prologue to Thomas' unfinished Super Psalmos, one of the last and most masterful works of the Magister, he accordingly made clear that within the universal theological scope of the Psalter, Christ and his members are the special materia, the theme and content of the whole book. Indeed, Thomas called the Psalter fere evangelium et non profetia, almost gospel rather than prophecy. In granting the text the special near gospel status, moreover, Thomas says that whereas other prophets prophesied through veiled images of the realities they foretold, David was inspired directly by the unclothed truth. The Dionysian echo here is not an illusion. I'll return to this at the end. There's also another key point of reference for Thomas, however, the condemnation of Theodore of Mopsuestia by the Second Council of Constantinople. Thomas' account of the council is puzzling as a reading of the actual censure, but a knowledge of the Constitutum Vigili of Pope Vigilius, Vigilius might explain Thomas' specific understanding of the case. Aquinas' version is, in any event, crystal clear in its implications, which are quite considerable for his hermeneutical thought. I quote, Theodore of Mopsuestia said that in sacred scripture and in the prophets, nothing is said expressly of Christ, nihil expressi dicitur but rather about certain other things and only adapted to Christ, adapta verum Christo. For example, the verse of the Psalm, they divided my vestments is not about Christ, but is spoken literally about David, said ad literum dictus de David. This manner of commenting was condemned by that council and whoever undertakes to expose the scriptures thus is a heretic. Manifestly, Thomas felt bound in rejecting Theodore's writings to reject the entire Antiochian theory of the literal sense of the Psalms. This does not mean a flight into allegory, however, very far from it. Thomas had his own reservations and concerns on the Alexandrian front as well. The Antiochian school, of course, essentially wished to limit David's intended meaning 
his sole intended meaning, and hence the whole literal meaning of the text to the psalmist's immediate historical context. Anything beyond this was a matter of adaptatio, an exegetical operation that Thomas elsewhere compares to the malpractice of a de- and recontextualized twisting of extracted phrases, as when Virgil's words about Anchises, pendebat et fixusque, are mined from the Aeneid and reframed to take on a Christological meaning. Theodore's massive interpretive error, a form of reduction at once positivist and linguistic, greatly impressed Aquinas. Likely first encountered later in his career, during his heavy engagement with Greek sources, Thomas also mentions Theodore's interpretive heterodoxy in the commentaries on Matthew and John. However, late the discovery, the crux of the historicist Antiochian view was nevertheless already grasped by the fifth objector to Article 1 of Question 6 of Quadablet 7. In making a reply and citing Jerome, the young Parisian master showed that he understood already from day one that scripture's instrumental human authors, and not merely the Holy Spirit as principal author, could and often did entertain multiple intentions, importing thereby multiple meanings into the text. A psalm might accordingly speak at once, at one and the same literal level, both of David, figuraliter, and of Christ, spiritualiter, yet ad literum. The biblical letter could accordingly split into two distinct, yet figurally congruent meanings, just as the spiritual sense was for its part split into three. Alongside the divisio textus, there is thus a still more foundational divisio sensus, a multi-branched semiotic theological tree. It might equally be the case, of course, that a single non-figural prophetic intention prevailed so that even the spiritual letter of an Old Testament text might have one univocal Christological reference, Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin with child, for example. Speaking again against Theodore's error, Thomas' treatment of Matthew's fulfillment citations makes this important further precision to his Antiochian view of the literal sense. We lost you there for about one minute. I apologize. We're we'll back on now. <laughs> okay. Um, Repeat the last three sentences or so, that will be fine. Perfect. The biblical letter could accordingly split into two distinct, yet figurally congruent meanings, just as the spiritual sense was for its part split into three. Alongside the divisio textus, there's thus a still more foundational divisius sensus, a multi-branched semiotic theological tree. It might equally be the case, of course, that a single non-figural prophetic intention prevail, so that even the spiritual letter of an Old Testament text might have one univocal Christological reference, Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin with child, for example. Speaking again against Theodore's error, Thomas' treatment of Matthew's fulfillment citations makes this important further precision to his anti-Antiochian anti view of the literal sense. We thus come at last to the theoretical heart of the matter for Thomas. The Christological sense of the Psalter, and of certain other key prophecies as well, is itself a revealed datum of the first order through which the New Testament actively and overtly avails, unveils the old. To find prophetic texts in the evangelists and even in Jesus' own mouth, that is in the gospel's very verba, is namely an entirely different interpretive theological event than seeing, for instance, an image of Christ through an allegory applied to the veiled res of the Joseph story. The latter being a mere similitudo remains ambiguously multivalent in the manner of any res. It cannot function in a logically controllable way. Quote, since one thing can be similar to many others, Thomas says in the Quad Libet, nothing about any of them in particular can be derived from what scripture says about that one thing. Such an inference would be fallacious. For example, because of some similarity, a lion is used to signify both Christ and the devil. Hence, whatever scripture says about a lion, cannot form the basis of an argument inferring anything about either one of, or the other. To say that Joseph resembles Jesus, thus brings us exactly nowhere. Thomas, accordingly, perceives two entirely different modalities of the Old Testament's Christological meaning, spiritual and prophetic. Allegory, despite its high Alexandrian and patristic place of honor, and the letter, despite its bad press since Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, thus mutually mark off a theological fault line and erect a major asymmetry of great consequence for sacro doctrina. The traditional spiritual sense is not thereby discarded 
by Thomas, however, as somehow untrue or unintended by God, the cornerstone of an older monastic and pastoral regime of scriptural reading is instead doctrinally downgraded relative to a new university culture of interpretation on account of its constitutive lack of logic. St. Thomas had already ensured the definitive and exclusive triumph of the literal sense while St. Bonaventure was still pouring out his seraphic soul in allegories. This is the summary laudatio voiced by Father Lagrange. Much has been said of Thomas' interest in the literal sense, and a great deal of it is confusing, if not downright confused. I have insisted that overstatements of his originality should be chastened. I would not wish, however, to underplay how startling it is when Thomas claims that Gregory has exhausted the spiritual reading of the book of Job. It resembles Benedict saying that the historical critical method has yielded its essential fruit. Where Origen had famously held that passages exist that are void of any literal sense, Master Thomas and his quadlibet went so far in the other direction as to explain very precisely how certain verses have no spiritual, but only a literal sense. Plainly, a major redirection of the exegetical project is underway. That silly and self-flattering anachronisms regarding Thomas' understanding of the census literalis must be avoided should by now, nevertheless, hopefully also be perfectly clear. We cannot pretend that Thomas' literal sense is whatever sub-theological and historicist meaning we may assign to that concept today. Even so, I would not be comfortable following a recent author's provocative thesis, which overdefines the gap and paradigm shift, defining Thomas' literal sense as the primary sense that God as the scripture's primary author intended, as though the spiritual sense was not equally intended, and as though scripture's letter did not function on the instrumental human authorial order. Time is precious and nearly expired, so I will be brief and cut to the chase. To my mind, the most accurate way to describe Aquinas' vision is as follows. The sensus literalis is the theological sense. It is that level of textual meaning required for scripture to function as a strictly ruled theological source. This means, of course, theology as it was concretely imagined by Thomas, namely based upon the revealed principles of the rule of faith and susceptible to the formalities of Aristotelian science. The quote literal sense is hence a hermeneutically calibrated effort to answer one pressing and primordial question. How can scripture deliver rigorously scientific theological doctrine? Precisely because Aquinas' construction of the census literalis, which is defined on the order of verba voces in an optimally expansive fashion, is hinged in this way to his wider theological project of conceptualizing a scientific modality for sacra doctrina, we can affirm a certain formidable originality in his conception, despite the fact that Thomas is hardly the first to have claimed that theological argument must always be based in and on the literal sense. Stephen Langton, for instance, had expressed the same principle a generation earlier as chancellor in Paris. In the different contexts of the 1250s, however, the primacy of the literal sense, we may now add as a multiform literal sense, was already acquiring a new meaning insofar as exegesis and theology were by then mutually redefining themselves in measurably new ways. The Dominicans' controversial interest in Aristotle here naturally set them and their theological model against the secular masters. We caught a whiff of that in William's distaste for philosophical argumentation. I prefer, however, to stress here at the end, as I come to the conclusion, the specifically Dionysian pedigree that Thomas imported, for it remains insufficiently recognized and yet situates his more celebrated Aristotelian project, which for Thomas does not actually occupy the entirety of theological exegetical space. The celestial hierarchy makes a series of discrete but critical cameos across all the relevant texts in which Thomas explicitly handles the literal and spiritual senses of scripture. At the beginning of his commentary on Lombard's sentences, the qualifying work of the young master to be, the brilliant quadlibetal questions from 1256, and of course, several times in the famous first question of the Summa. The Super Psalmos likewise cites Dionysius at the very outset for what it is worth. There's good reason for the sustained Dionysian turn. As Thomas himself acknowledges, Dionysius provides a paradigm for theological science grounded on revealed scripture rather than on reason. It is natural therefore that Thomas should find attractive and useful the Dionysian theory of metaphorical symbolical veils 
It equips him in his effort to position the scripture's poetic discourse in correct relation to a solidly founded univocal sacred science. Utra modus procendi sit artificialis, whether scripture is poetic, artistic, that is scientific, is the formulation of the key article in question one of the sentence's commentary, whose link to articles eight, nine, and 10 of question one of the Summa is evident upon inspection. Thomas' answer to this earlier version of theology's foundational question concludes with an important distinction between the two ur modalities of sacred doctrine, argumentative and symbolic. Only the literal, quote, only the literal sense is used for the destruction of error, since the other senses are through similitudes, and there cannot be argumentation by means of terms expressive of similitudes. That is why Dionysius says in the letter to Titus that symbolic theology is not argumenta argumentative. For Thomas, the bifurcation of biblical signification into two further subdivided registers of literal and spiritual meaning corresponds, in the end, to two parallel branches of theological thought, what we might call scientific and mystical theology. This divisio of sacra doctrina is far from mirroring the modern distinction between positive and dogmatic theological domains, still less a Gablerian opposition of historical philology and philosophical doctrine. It cuts across the traditional practical speculative division, moreover, and moral theology, whether ascetical or mystical, is no monopoly of the spiritual, moral, that is broader mystical sense. A peerless master of, Dionysian, of the Dionysian model might be a doctor like John of the Cross, yet one might equally easily show how Thomas Mendicant co-master in 13th century Paris, Bonaventure of Bagnoregio, also worked from within his own powerful version of this Dionysian frame. The Franciscan's De Reductione Artium ad Theologiam is a stellar performance, powerfully integrating his mystical minorite theological vision into the context of medieval Parisian university life, a vision that amazingly has no place for the senses literalis, but finds its contemplative acme in the triplex illumination of spiritual reading. The vibrant Dionysian tenor of Thomas' own lecture, Rigans Montes, reveals that the Dominican friar also saw his new status as master to belong to the same cascade of celestial light. Even so, in the end, Thomas was professionally anchored, that is to say, both as professor and professed religious, on the demonstrative scientific end of the spectrum. His perfection and refinement of an argumentative Aristotelian mode of exegesis, adjacent to Dionysius' fading symbolical world, was not merely adapted to a 13th century university culture of controversy and lively debate. It perfectly suited an order of preachers born from the bosom of real life theological disputation and consecrated to the pastoral destruction of error. Thank you.